Good afternoon. Welcome, bienvenue, and welcome. My name is Kelly Lamb. I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at Mila. And from our home to yours, we want to welcome you today. Over the last seven weeks, we've been presenting Mila Live, really in response to you, our customers. We've been trying to answer the questions you may have about products that you own in your home or products that you're actually interested in buying. We are very excited today to bring to you our second segment as part of a new initiative called Hashtag Mila Dines Local. This initiative we started was really intended to try to help support many of the small local restaurants across the country that are facing challenges as we all are during these very unique times. What we're doing is we've actually put a challenge out there to chefs and restaurants to share with us their signature dish from their restaurant and we're inviting them to share that with us on Meal Alive. In addition to that, along with the restaurant and the chef, we're actually going to purchase 100 meals from the restaurant and actually donate that to essential frontline workers that are out there supporting our communities across Canada right now. I also want to welcome our viewers from our key retail partners that have invited their customers to join us today on Meal Alive. From out in Vancouver, um, we have Trail Appliances, Baker Appliances, um, as well as Midland Appliances. In the uh, Ontario area, we have uh, Goman's Appliances, Tasco Appliances, as well as Appliance Canada. And out on the east side, we've got um, Creative Appliances and Almar Appliances in Montreal. So I want to welcome uh, viewers from our uh, retail partners who actually are opening right now as well. I'm really excited today to have Chef Robert Rubino from Cellar Door here in Toronto uh, joining us on Meal Alive. Welcome, Robert. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, nice to be part of the initiative. Yeah, I'm so glad uh, that you're actually able to join us. Um, so maybe tell us a little bit about Cellar Door. Um, when did you guys start the restaurant? Uh, and, uh, you know, what are, what's, some, what's some of the uh, cooking inspiration behind Cellar Door? Uh, well, I always grew up just always around food between uh, my grandparents making the, the big uh, jars of tomato sauce in their garage um, and then just every event, uh, family event was always based around food so it really got me into cooking and then uh, I just always had the, the travel bug and so uh, at university I learned a couple of languages and um, went to culinary school and then started traveling and working in different kitchens around the world. Uh, the restaurant actually opened six years ago. We're celebrating our six-year uh, wow. anniversary on Saturday, so it's kind of bittersweet in this <laughs> in this given environment. Yes, but we've been open for uh, six years now, and we've just had to alter our our model a little bit right now. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that, and uh, you know, hopefully, we can celebrate with uh, with our viewers today live. Um, so. Why did you choose, what is the dish that you're going to do with us today and kind of why did you uh, choose that dish to share? So we're making bucatini alla matriciana. It's a very humble uh, dish, Roman dish. Um, we put it on the menu just to showcase um, how very fresh and simple ingredients can make very tasty dishes when they're done properly. Um, all of our pasta is made in-house as well as our breads and doughs. Um, we use uh, some local uh, artisanal products and then obviously uh, some, some tomatoes uh, from Italy when they're not in season in Ontario. Yep. And um, the dish has uh, just become something that we've been known for, I guess, just because we do it uh, so well. Um, the idea was to have a restaurant uh, similar to a, a small neighborhood bistro where I saw a lot of uh, in Paris when I was uh, living and cooking there. Yep. And the idea um, was to always change the menu. So really quickly after we opened, uh, some dishes went out and some new dishes came on. Um, and people just kept asking for the bucatini back. So, so six years later, it's still, it's still on the menu. Still on the menu. Yeah. So um, before we get started, and we'll, we'll continue to talk a little bit as, as you get cooking, um, for our viewers, where is the restaurant located? The restaurant's located in Etobicoke, South Etobicoke, on Lakeshore, uh, just a couple of blocks west of Islington. Uh, so it's a great little uh, neighborhood, kind of a hidden gem just because of all the parks and the, uh, the location close to the lake. 
and we've settled down there, me and my wife, who was uh, working with me at the restaurant before we had two little kids <laughs> who were also fixtures uh, in the <laughs> restaurant for some time. And uh, we put down roots there and we're happy to be part of the community there. So truly a family owned restaurant. Yes, that's, exactly. That's great. Um, so, you know, for, the, for those viewers that are obviously in the GTA area, um, you know, be sure to, to support Robert and his restaurant. For those of you that are out of province, uh, and we have viewers from Vancouver across the country, uh, hopefully you can take some tips and tricks and kind of recreate this if, uh, since you can't uh, try Robert's restaurant right now. So why don't we get started? Where do you okay. want to start uh, the dish right now? Uh, we'll start with the dough. Okay. Uh, this is kind of the, I think, the most important part. Uh, we make a nice, big, fat, dense noodle, and that's why um, uh, people like it uh, especially at the restaurant um, and the kids really like it because it's got some really nice chew to it. Uh, so for that we're going to start with semolina flour as opposed to white flour. It's just a hardier uh, durum hard wheat so it just makes a stronger dough. Uh, the basic recipe is going to be for one kilo 450 grams of water. So no eggs here either. Uh, makes a great uh, vegan pasta as well. Um, so I've just halved the recipe so we have 500 grams of semolina going into the bowl and 225 grams of water going into the bowl. Um, it's a very forgiving uh, dough as well to put together. You just want to get in there with your hands and start squeezing the water and the flour until you make a nice wet sand. Uh, once we have that, we can bring it out of the bowl and really start to knead it just to develop a little bit of the, the gluten. Um, we're not going to get time to rest this dough, so we want to make sure that we've, we've uh, given enough uh, work to it to develop the gluten. Um, one question we always hear is, should we rest the dough? Um, in the case of a, a, an egg dough where you're maybe cutting it by hand, mm -hmm. yeah, you definitely want to rest it for about 30 minutes um, just to allow the water to hydrate the dough, which allows the, uh, the gluten to, act, to activate, and you'll have a nice, strong, sturdy dough. So even though it's fresh, you'll still get that al dente uh, feel to it. So here, once the dough comes together, we just want to get it on your, on your cutting board and really, really start to work it. But that's actually pretty simple as far as ingredients go uh, to that's make it. that. That's it. Flour and water. Like I said, it's a very simple uh, Roman dish. Um, and the ingredients you'll see as we get going are, are very simple to build um, if you can find the, the right ingredients. So as we're, as we're uh, kneading here, we're just trying to develop a little bit of the strength in the dough because we won't have um, the ability to rest the dough. I don't like to rest the semolina doughs in, in, the, in the case of doing an extruded pasta because we don't want the dough to hydrate. We want to keep it as dry as possible because it's going to be mm. pressed through a machine. And you were saying in the restaurant uh, your pastas are homemade. Everything's homemade in the restaurant. Um, everything's made from scratch and homemade. Uh, yeah, we do a really nice pizza as well that's quite popular now for now that we switch to a, a takeout format. So how are you guys adapting right now uh, to obviously this very unique situation that we're all facing? You're, you're doing takeout. Uh, what are some of the items on the menu that uh, seem to be the most popular right now for takeout? Yeah, so we switched to a takeout format. Um, so we've, we've actually um, downsized the menu a little bit to do some of our fresh pastas. Uh, the pizzas that come out of our wood-burning oven, obviously, they're a big hit right now for takeout. Um, and we're about to introduce some, uh, some salads and a few more appetizers, but we've also switched to do uh, family-style platters. As we know, people are having more time to sit down and eat with their families now. A lot of people are working from home, and a lot of people are, are also cooking from home, so we're giving them options to take even just the pizza doughs home with them okay. and the family-style platters. Uh, we're doing some lasagnas that are a big hit right now, some bigger shared-style um, whole chickens or uh, meatballs. We can, you can buy uh, our sauce and soon we'll be uh, starting to sell some of our sliced charcuterie as well. Wow, and the charcuterie, is that also made in-house? The charcuterie is actually from um, a small local artisanal producer in Caledon, and that's where we're gonna use the guanciale to make the, the pasta. Perfect. So the dough, we just wanna break it into some smaller pieces here. And then we can flour this dough again. We wanna try and keep it as dry as possible. Um, as it's going to go through um, a die that's going to give it its shape. So I'll bring the dough over to the extruder. We've just brought a, a small KitchenAid extruder with us.
And these are really fun to have at home, especially uh, if you have children. It's very similar to a, a Play-Doh machine. The dough is almost like the Play-Doh and the extrusion is, is very similar. So once the noodles start to come out, uh, we'll just cut them to the length that we want. We'll blanch them for a couple of minutes and they'll go into the sauce. So we can work on the sauce too now. Okay. And Robert, uh, you know, I actually, I'm sure a lot of our viewers actually would ask the question because I'm sure many of them have similar extruders at home. What's the best way to clean those or maintain the, the attachment part? Yeah, so you don't want to leave anything um, inside the machine once you're done um, uh, extruding the pasta. So you want to make sure that you take out all of the leftover pasta as it won't push it all through. Um, the dye itself, you want to leave it in a dry area. Let the dough actually dry inside and then clean it once uh, the, the, the dough is dry. Because you won't get it all if it's very sticky still. Okay. Um, and then just make sure that the hopper is clean and obviously you never want to immerse it in water or wet it. A lot of our pasta equipment, um, it's just seeing flour and water so we don't want to ever- Mix it with other- uh, Mix it or, or uh, get it wet. Okay. Okay. So we can start the sauce now while that's cooking. Uh, we want to start with some onions. I like red onions and we want to cut them nice and thick. We're going to cook them in uh, some olive oil and by cutting them thicker we're just going to do it nice and on a nice slow heat and we'll allow that to, um, to kind of just get nice and sweet without caramelizing because that's a different flavor and without uh, burning if they were too thin. Once we add the guanciale in there you'll see um, everything start to kind of marry and render really well. Um, if you have really good olive oil at home don't be, uh, don't be shy with it. There's, uh, olive oil is a great flavor, it's great to cook with, and again, if we're keeping the heat really low, we're not gonna have um, any issues with leaving any of those, or losing any of those good qualities in the olive oil. And Robert, for this dish here, uh, with the bucantini, yes. um, kind of what are the benefits of using this specific pasta? You know, you're right, it has a bit more chew, it's a little thicker. Um, you know, it could could people at home if they can't get bucatini right now or don't make it, can they substitute that with something else? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely dry bucatini is uh, also a good substitution if you're not going to be making the pasta at home. Uh, the sauce is quick and simple, and it's really the whole family will enjoy it. Um, but spaghetti is really nice. You okay. can just cut that a little bit thicker. Any long noodle. So the bucatini, what's special about it? Uh, buca, uh, a buco obviously means a small hole or a hole. So there's actually ah, okay. a small hole that runs through and that's where the extrusion part happens. Um, and it's going to trap a little bit of that sauce on the inside and, and on the outside. Delicious. Okay. So I'll just keep an eye on these. I'm going to go back to my pasta. Yeah, it looks like it's coming along very nicely. Yeah. And Robert, right now for the restaurant, are you guys, uh, what days are you open and what hours are you open? So we're open Wednesday through Sunday right now. Okay. From about uh, 5 to 8.30, so the hours are a little bit shorter. Um, and we're just doing uh, takeout, like we said, so no, no need to be there uh, too late. Okay. Okay. And so you said with the onions, you do, this, for this particular dish, you really don't, you're not, your goal is not to caramelize the onions. No, I just want to get them uh, really cooked really lightly in the tomato sauce. It's also a, a way that you would build a tomato sauce um, without the guanciale. You could cut up the onions a lot smaller, but if you really like onions in your pasta, then you can leave them big. Okay. Uh, the guanciale, like I said, is from a small uh, artisanal producer, Il Taliere, in, um, in Caledon. Mm -hmm. So you can find their product... Uh, in a lot, of, a lot of grocery stores right now. Uh, but we've been using them uh, for six years since we opened, and uh, they've grown quite a bit to become accessible to the pub general public. So I like to cut this really, really, really thick. Um, that way it's got some really nice bite to it. Some of the fat is gonna render out uh, with the onions and uh, just make a really nice smell in your home. And then we'll put the heat up just a little bit until it gets crispy before we add the wet ingredient, which is the tomato sauce. Okay, and I think, you know, with, uh, with most cultures and dishes, I think when dishes are simple, you know, the quality of the actual ingredient is so important. It ha yes. Um, so it's great that you're working with the local purveyor for, for the guanciale. Um, maybe just for the viewers out there that are not so familiar with what 
Guanciale actually is. Uh, maybe you want to explain to them what actually Guanciale is. That's a great question. So it's actually a pig jowl that's been cured in salt. So the jaw part of the, the pig. The jaw part of the pig. So it's very, very, very similar to uh, pancetta. But again, it's just uh, the Italians using up every part of the animal. And as the, you can see, it has the very, almost the very similar striations of fat and meat that, that the belly would. Mm -hmm. So they're using that up, again, just to, to take a humble ingredient and make it uh, into an everyday ingredient. Um, so again, obviously right now for all of us, you know, uh, grocery shopping can be a challenge yes. in sourcing things. Um, what would be a optional replacement substitute if somebody right now would want to make this dish but can't find guanciale? Okay, so pancetta, like I said, would, would be the only um, substitute here. Okay. So we can't use bacon. Okay. Uh, bacon is a smoked product. Uh, they're both cured, but in different ways. So different flavor profile. Different obviously. flavor, it would bring too much smokiness. It would be just as delicious, obviously, you put bacon in anything. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. pretty delicious, but um, pancetta would be very similar and uh, have the same uh, flavor profile, okay. whereas the bacon would be smoked. And the thing that uh, Il Taliere does really nice is they cure uh, for a lot longer than maybe a, a more industrial type of pancetta or guanciale. So you really get the, uh, the flavor of the fermented side of the, of the uh, jowl or belly, okay. which really, really, really brings flavor to the sauce. And again, a reason why people keep coming back to the restaurant for it. The ingredients have been chosen properly, and, and, and I think all those little like. things do make the difference at the end of the day, especially when on a simple dish when the ingredients need to speak for themselves. Okay, so our pancetta is rendered out, and now you also have that fat that's rendered mixed with the olive oil. So now we have two different uh, really nice simple flavors happening there, and we can add some garlic, chopped, chopped garlic, about a teaspoon of chopped garlic just until you smell the aroma of it coming up. We don't want to burn the garlic either. Let's take that off the heat for a second. Uh, you can use your, your favorite can of uh, tomatoes. We have also some tomato sauce uh, from the restaurant, um, also available to purchase. Okay. Um, but we just want to get in there. I, I like these because they're cherry tomatoes. They're a little bit sweeter. Uh, the kids like them especially. <laughs> uh, we don't want to break up the seeds. Uh, so you really don't want to put your tomato sauce through a blender. I think that's uh, a common mistake, is putting the, the can of tomato or the tomatoes through a blender. Um, a potato ricer works really well if okay. you really want to blend them up, or it's just really nice to get your, get hands, your hand in hands. there. That's great for the kids to do too. Yeah, it's really nice for the kids to do, and these cherry tomatoes are a little bit sweeter, so the kids really, really like them as well. Okay, so now we can cook that for a little bit. I'm just going to wash my hands. Okay. So uh, while uh, Robert uh, washes his hands very quickly, uh, again, uh, be sure to follow uh, us on uh, MilaLive.ca, also our Facebook and Twitter account, uh, to, to learn more about hashtag Mila Dines Local. Be sure to look up uh, Robert and uh, his restaurant, uh, Cellar Door, um, and follow them as well. Uh, you guys are on uh, Instagram? We're on Instagram, yes. Okay. Um, Facebook, Instagram is a cellar door. Okay. Uh, to. And um, the easiest way to find us is just to go to our website at cellardoorrestaurant.ca and you can find more about ordering there. Uh, and so, how hours. would a customer order right now actually uh, with you? Right now, we prefer to take the orders um, online. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, in, in person uh, over the phone instead of online okay. just so we can um, ensure that the food is going out uh, at the freshest and, and most convenient time for the customer as opposed to taking orders online where it's a, a little bit longer wait times or not so specific uh, as to when uh, the, the, the food is ready because everything is made uh, very fresh and a la minute. We want the customer to arrive as soon as it's being plated. Okay, that's okay. great. And Robert, maybe we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, because you really actually have a very extensive um, culinary background. Um, maybe you talk a little bit about how did you get started? Uh, what inspired you to get started and kind of where your travels have taken you? Yeah, so traveling was a big one for me. I really wanted uh, to travel and learn, um, especially through cooking. And I felt like it was something that I could express uh, both the, the want to, to learn how to cook uh, from an inability to not know how to cook. <laughs> 
and to um, be able to see a little bit of the world. So I went to school, uh, culinary school in upstate New York okay. at the Culinary Institute of America there. And that just took me um, traveling. Um, from there, I did an internship in Italy uh, for about eight months uh, at a really cool old, old restaurant, uh, one of the original uh, Michelin starred restaurants in Italy, in a small town just outside Bologna. It was an old monastery, so perfect underground caves for a wine collection, over 30,000 bottles of wine there. <laughs> wow. and it was a really unique experience that just opened my eyes up to uh, a different world and a different side of cooking. And from there, I went to Argentina to cook for again for eight months, then off to the west coast of Canada to see the amazing produce and product and, and fish and seafood that they have there. And that's where I met my uh, wife, um, May League, so she's actually French. So from there we went to France together. Also uh, a culinary center around the world. Yeah, so it was uh, the southern, southern France for a little bit and then we ended up in Paris and settling there for, for a while while I cooked there and she went back to finish her studies there. And at the end of the day we just decided that Toronto would be home and we uh, put down some roots uh, with the restaurant in Etobicoke and soon thereafter with a, a house and uh, decided to raise a, a, a nice family there with uh, my little, my two little kids, uh, Sophie and Elio. And now uh, we just have had an un, an unbelievable time growing in the community where we've learned, we've watched other families grow as well. They've watched ours grow, and yeah. we know everybody by name in, in the community now. So it's a really great, uh, a great thing to have uh, both a, a small business there and a community that has been supporting us from day one. Oh, that, but that's, uh, you know, the community is very lucky to have your restaurant and, and you guys there. Oh, so uh, hopefully they'll continue to support you uh, through this, as, as we all will. Yeah. The sauce is coming together. The sauce is coming together, so we can uh, blanch the pasta now. We've made a little bit of that. The bucantini here. And how long, Robert, will that take to blanch and cook? So fresh like that, it will take only about three minutes. Okay. So you want to make sure that your water is really well salted. That will season the, the pasta. So we don't really use too much salt in the sauce. The guanciale is, is pretty salty. The cheese that we finish with is salty. And the uh, tomatoes have a little bit of acidity, which counts for, for um, a little bit of seasoning in itself. So as soon as you drop your pasta, especially with fr fresh pasta, you want to make sure you stir it just to loosen it up a little bit. And we'll let that cook for about two or three minutes. And is this really a very similar dish to the one that you actually do in the restaurant? Like if this, I was is, a... this is it. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, we build everything uh, a la minute, so all the onions and the, um, the garlic. We use a little bit of white wine at the restaurant too. That helps to bring out a little bit more, uh, or marry a little bit more of the flavor of the, the rendering of the guanciale fat, okay. the olive oil, and it helps to create a nice uh, sauce. Um, so we can do that with a little bit of the pasta water too. Right. And we can do that with um, some oils as well. That's really going to help uh, um, bring bring everything bring together. everything together. Help that sauce really stick onto the sauce uh, onto the pasta. Okay. Um, most Roman dishes they'll use a lot of uh, black pepper. We all know the famous dish, the cacio pepe, yep. the carbonara, and the amatriciana. That's kind of the the big three. Uh, so we have some nice uh, sheep cheese, again from Italy. Um, and then we have two oils. We make a really nice basil oil at the restaurant and a chili oil. Now we also uh, cure and can our own chilies uh, at the end of every year and they usually last us till about May uh, as they become more and more popular. People are eating more of them and they only right. last us till about March or April <laughs> every year. But that really is great to see that everything is really homemade even from, uh, from the sauce standpoint. Um, Robert, do you mind if we maybe take a couple of questions from uh, some viewers out there that uh, have a couple of questions right yeah, now of course. while we finish up? So uh, we have Mary Copert. Uh, Mary, thanks for joining us today. Mary's question is, do you need to put oil in the water? That's actually a really good question because I know, you know, you've seen different chefs. Some do, some don't. Um, what's your opinion on, on this one? Um, I see a lot of people doing that maybe with the dry pasta because it tends to stick a lot more. Um, in the restaurant, we're always using fresh pasta, so we don't uh, use the oil in, in the water. Okay. It's not necessary, yeah. Okay. Um, and then we have another question from uh, Stephanie. Stephanie, thanks for joining us today. Um, can the pasta be made with gluten-free flour? If yes, what kind? 
Um, okay, well, gluten-free flour. I mean, it can be made with gluten-free. Um, oh, you're asking about the fresh pasta. Yeah, I think that so. Those... It's more of a combination of flours. Um, okay. What they what they would be specifically, I don't know. Okay. Uh, it would be a combination of rice flour, uh, some kind of a stabilizer or thickener like xanthan. Right. And there's lots of recipes out there, and I would definitely encourage people to go and and try to make a gluten-free uh, pasta from from scratch. Um, I would recommend that you're rolling it out though and cutting it by hand. Maybe not so much in the extruder. Okay. As it might be uh, too dry or too wet. Okay, that, that's yeah. actually a good tip because you know I know there are a lot of people uh, out there right now that that either have celiac or are require gluten-free options. So yeah. that's great. Um, and uh, there's another, I guess, question from Liz. Uh, so Liz, uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon with Robert and I. Um, Liz would like confirmation if the sauce is available to purchase at the restaurant. So right now it's just the tomato sauce. So just the tomato th sauce, which is the basic building block of many, many sauces. Right. Um, you can uh, fry up a little bit of uh, ground beef and pork and add the tomato sauce and you have a bolognese. Right. Um, you can fry up some guanciale uh, with some onions and garlic, finish it with your favorite chili oil and you have an amatriciana. So it's basically the, the building block of a lot of uh, sauces in the restaurant. Okay. So Liz, hopefully that answers your question and you can also stop by and say hi to Chef Robert yes. if he's there. Um, we have another question from Stephanie as well. Um, you mentioned about the wine that you would use to finish in the restaurant. Stephanie's question is when would you actually add that wine um, the in the wine? process? Yeah. Right after you add the garlic. Um, it helps to cool the pan down a little bit so you don't burn the garlic. Um, and it helps to pick up all of those uh, little renderings of the, of the guanciale. So a bit of deglazing onion, a, little a little bit. A little bit of deglazing and it's going to help emulsify and bring everything together. So fat, you need a fat and a liquid to emulsify and have like a little bit of thickening happening to the sauce and helping it to stick to the sauce as well. Okay, great. Okay, so that's what we're going to do next. We're going to actually finish the pasta and we like to finish it. Uh, so you want to make sure that your, your sauce is bubbling. So that's the agitation. Then we need um, a fat and a water, so we have a little bit of the water that was on the pasta and a little bit of water from the pot. And there's also some nice starch that was left in there that'll help thicken this. So we have our basil oil. And again, don't be shy, and our chili oil. Okay. And we just wanna agitate the pasta to kind of get everything to emulsify and thicken. And then you want to finish the pasta. So the last two minutes of cooking should happen in the pan. So we want to cut short um, the pasta cooking in the right. water, especially with the, the dried pasta that will stand up more and the fresh pasta. So if it's, we, I say three minutes, but it's really five minutes. And the last okay. two minutes will happen here in the pan. And you'll see actually the sauce will just thicken right before your eyes with the combination of the oils, uh, the starch from the pasta itself, and a little bit of that water. And as soon as it starts to thicken, you can shut your heat off. Okay. We can get the cheese in, and that will really, really help everything stick. We never want to add the cheese uh, to the pan when there's still the fire on. It will just burn and stick the, the cheese okay. to the bottom as, instead of to the sauce. So we're nice and thick there. We have some fresh grated pecorino, which is the sheep cheese. Fresh basil, everyone's always garnishing with the basil, but the basil should go right in there. And that's so that some of the residual, so the heat will actually release some of the flavors. Flavor of that, that basil, you'll really taste it. Um, again, there's no sense in being pretty if the, flavors, <laughs> if the flavor is not there. And just like that, we can see that the, everything is sticking, really everything emulsified. is shining, everything is, is really looking good there. So we can come over to plate that. Here, I'm going to move this away for you. Yep. Well, that's that. I'll take that. That's it. And if you get if you get really good at it, there's no splashes. Okay. Just want to collect some of that sauce from the bottom and those nice crunchy, chewy bits of guanciale that really uh, are the star of this dish. And then, as always, 
we're going to finish with a little bit more of cracked black pepper and a fresh grating of pecorino cheese. Okay, and there we are. Wow. Where that came from, yeah. Fresh. Fresh, simple, quick, um, yeah, and really, really, really delicious. I think that is the, the goal um, of Italian cooking. It really, really is the goal of Italian cuisine. Um, they're a little bit more fortunate where they have access to those ingredients. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it's more readily available there, and it's, it's really hard to, to imitate um, Italian cuisine here in, in Toronto, I'm finding, but we're starting to find some really nice local producers that mm -hmm. are starting to slow down a little bit um, and find ways to really create a, a great product. A much more with, artisanal product. A much more artisanal product with, uh, you know, local Ontario um, produce products, and produce, animals. I mean, we have everything here. We have access to some yeah. of the best fish and seafood and the best flour and the best uh, meat. It's, it's all being exported, so it must be the best. <laughs> and so we're, we're finding, uh, you know, people are coming a little bit back to to the old way of doing things and slowing down and making things properly. And it's, it's starting to show more in the food scene in, in Toronto, I think. Well, thanks, Robert. That's, uh, that's great. Now, amazing dish. Uh, I, I'm sure many of our viewers right now are dying to get there. Can they order this dish right now? Yes, like I said, uh, we tried to take it off the menu a couple of times. But okay. But it's, it's on the menu, it's on the menu for takeout. So um, for takeout as well, they can get that? For takeout as well. Um, and again, like I said, you can, um, you can buy the tomato sauce. Right. And if you can't find the guanciale, I'm sure we can uh, help you with that as well. Um, again, it's just those two very simple products that really make this dish. Your okay. favorite can of tomatoes, uh, maybe an onion and some garlic, and, and you can really make this dish at home. Um, when this whole thing first happened, we had closed for two or three weeks just to assess the situation and how we could uh, come back and offer um, takeout in a very safe way. And until we figured that out, we were encouraging people to cook at home okay. uh, more than ever. People were home. Um, we started with some, some videos and some blogging and we really, really want people to, you know, take this time to slow down and really cook at home with their, with their families or, or whoever might um, be around. And just uh, also share that food with your neighbors and your family. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, th I think that's, uh, that's great that you were able to share that with us. So maybe just uh, as we wrap up a little bit, um, what are some of the other most popular takeout dishes right now on your menu that you're seeing your customers coming back for over and over again? Yeah, the pizza definitely. Like I said, it's a wood-burning um, oven that we use, wood only. Um, so it's a really tricky oven to work with. But uh, again, the, the dough is made in-house, so it's a really special dough. Um, it's uh, again we slow down the fermentation process a little bit so it's about two to three days um, in wow. the fridge before we serve the dough so it sits really light uh, in your stomach as well again very simple products um, I think one thing that we do differently is that we cook a lot of the ingredients that go on the on the pizza mm -hmm. in the wood oven beforehand a lot Ooh. of ingredients you see go on raw on the right. pizzas um, so that's really uh, kind of give, gives a really nice uh, flavor smoky flavor to yeah. some of the ingredients Again, really nice um, artisanal products such as uh, some of our soppressata that goes on mm. in place of the traditional pepperoni. Right. And again, the doughs are for sale, so a lot of people are having fun uh, taking the taking dough home and trying to, uh, oh, that's to mimic too. that. And they're finding that the dough is really easy to work with uh, as opposed to something they might buy uh, at a bakery or that was industrial made somewhere else. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. So, you know, again, uh, Chef Robert Rubino, uh, cellar door here in Toronto. Uh, website uh, would be the easiest. Uh, yes. You can order via telephone or uh, in person. Yes, exactly. Um, and again, you guys are open? We're open Wednesday through Sunday, beginning around 5 o'clock, and okay. we're taking pre-orders uh, for some of the larger family-style uh, items at any time. Uh, and we're doing some small catering as well. Okay. Yeah. So again, uh, you know, I think it's great to see that you were also able to pivot your business in the current circumstances to manage through as, a, as an entrepreneur in the city. So that's great to see. So um, again, for you viewers that are out there that are in the GTA area, um, you know, be sure to support uh, Chef Robert Rubino and his team there because um, we want to make sure that when we all come out of this that uh, we can actually all get to the restaurant 
to actually enjoy uh, the amazing food that uh, you and your team are, are doing there. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, they're all working really hard to kind of adapt right now, and uh, I think, and I hope that we'll be able to keep uh, a lot of these products um, that are not on the menu uh, going and selling because we're having a, a really good response to them, and just keep that whole uh, sense of uh, a market going. Uh, as we get online, we'll be able to sell more products and reach uh, more people in the neighborhood a little bit easier. And they can really taste some of uh, Italy at home. Exactly, yes. That's great. Uh, well, Chef Robert, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank it, you it's for having me. It's yeah. fantastic for you to have. Again, um, you know, support your local small restaurants. Um, cellar door, look them up. Instagram, uh, follow, follow them there. They have some great pictures. It makes your mouth water. Uh, looking at some of the pictures there, so uh, be sure to follow them as well. Um, and uh, again, as part of our initiative here at Mila, hashtag Mila Dines Local, uh, we will actually be purchasing 100 meals from uh, Chef Robert and his team, challenge them to make 100 dishes, um, and we will collectively donate that to some of the uh, frontline workers that are out there right now. Um, thank you for joining us today, both uh, Chef Robert and uh, myself and the team here at Mila. Um, we hope to continue this initiative. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, follow our YouTube channel to get the latest videos where you'll also see this uh, posted in, in a little bit. And make sure you subscribe, turn your notification on to get the latest information there. Um, on behalf of uh, the Mila Canada team, Cellar Door, Chef Robert uh, Rubino, uh, Lastly, we want to thank all the frontline essential workers that are out there right now providing the necessary services to all the communities uh, across Canada right now, um, whether it's medical services, ensuring grocery uh, store shelves are stocked, uh, food deliveries, um, restaurants, uh, public transportation. Again, a very, very big thank you for all of you, your bravery during this time as you're out there ensuring that uh, the rest of the community is getting the services that uh, we all require. We really encourage everybody to uh, stay safe. Uh, we know businesses are slowly starting to reopen across the country right now. Um, but again, uh, stay safe with your family. Um, have a great meal together. Um, and uh, we look to see you again on the next episode of Mila Live. And uh, we will continue to bring you uh, new restaurants from uh, hashtag Mila Dines Local. So again, thank you on behalf of our entire team here.